Welcome to this Sarah Week conversation hosted by IHS Market. My name is Prashash Patel, and I head up the cost and technology group within IHS Market. And my co-chair today is David Voucher, who heads up our carbon capture practice. On today's session, we'll be addressing how upstream supply chain is transforming to enable energy transition. 2020 was a pivotal year for energy transition with numerous governments and upstream companies announcing their intentions to reach net zero emissions in the coming decades. These announcements are significant, yet they don't convey how complex and how massive scale uh, is involved in reorganizing the current upstream supply chain to achieve these targets. Uh, in this Sarah Week conversation, stakeholders from both operator and service companies will share steps they're currently taking, targets they hope to achieve, and challenges the industry still faces. On the panel today, we have some distinguished speakers. So I have Meta Halverson Ute, Chief Procurement Officer at Equinor, Abdella Merad, EVP Performance Manager at Slumberger, and uh, Frida Amat, Vice President Procurement Group at Petrono, uh, Pe uh, Petronas. I would like to welcome the panel today. And first I'll talk, turn to Mehta. Uh, how is Equinor approaching energy transition? Well, first of all, uh, Equinor will be turning 50 next year. So the company is almost as old as I am. And we have a long and proud history uh, as a Norwegian-based upstream oil and gas uh, company. And to build on our experience and competence, not least our extensive offshore experience, is our starting point on how we approach the energy transition. And then the Equinor strategy, always safe, high value, low carbon, stays firm, and has been further sharpened through our three strategic pillars and how we want to accelerate the energy transition, which is uh, by optimizing the oil and gas portfolio, uh, by high value growth in renewables, and, and lastly, uh, to, to look at new market opportunities in low carbon solutions. And uh, to follow up on that uh, within procurement, uh, what we do is to, to focus on creating value with our suppliers and, and partners. And um, a vital part of that is building competence and technologies across the industry to keep moving forward and improve together. As one example, we have established longer term technology collaboration agreements with key suppliers uh, to develop solutions within hydrogen, offshore wind, lower emissions from oil and gas, and automation and not least, of course, digitalization. And uh, we have started on our journey to, to develop new ways of working with suppliers to build more strategic partnerships, typically longer with fewer. The world changes faster and faster and the market has become tougher. And then also, of course, the margin margins lower. So, basis for everything we do within the supply chain and elsewhere in the company is zero harm. And that is our license to operate. As part of that, it, it is crucial to maintain and, and further develop safe, sustainable and efficient supply chains. So adding on to that, the oil and gas industry is under growing pressure politically and from various interest groups who wants us to slow down on oil and gas and to change our focus entirely to renewables. And we cannot ignore that, or we cannot ignore the serious threat of climate change. So we must do our part and lower emissions from our business substantially. There is only one way to turn, there is always one way that we can turn challenges into opportunities. And we, we need to work closely with our suppliers and partners to succeed with our net zero ambitions. So together, we must further develop solutions for decarbonization and accelerate low carbon solutions. And in the future market, I strongly believe that both how we produce and what we produce will matter to our customers. So we are also, of course, accelerating within growth in renewables and building new low carbon value chains and market opportunities. And in Equinor, we focused on 30, 40, 50, and uh, 30 
that is uh, what we aim for in terms of, of break even for our oil and gas portfolio. And that is to generate solid cash flow to enable the energy transition. And then we aim for a 40% net carbon intensity reduction by 2035 as a pathway to the Paris Agreement and our goal to become a net zero company. And we will allocate 50% of our capital towards renewable and low carbon solutions by the end of this decade. And that is a really ambitious goal. So our climate roadmap, it's transparent and ambitious something we must solve together. It includes the whole supply chain and moving ahead, I am confident there will be plenty of new opportunities for the industry. Great, uh, so I think there were a lot of really excellent ideas to pick up on there. The one I wanna focus on because it was mentioned several times is that of partnerships. So Abdelli, I think you represent one of the preeminent partners in the upstream industry. And uh, I wanted to hear from you sort of very tangibly, what steps are you taking to reduce emissions? And then what are some of the technologies you might be deploying to help your own clients and partners move along the energy, the energy transition? Thank you, David. Uh, I think really to, similar to many companies, right? In June, we have also announced our commitment you know, to net zero by 2050, right? And we have defined actually uh, three components, right? To achieve this ambition around you know, our operational emissions, this is exactly what we just mentioned, David, technology use emission, which is the technology we are developing, and, you know, carbon negative actions. And I think Mete has talked a lot about that, and I'm not going to talk about this, you know, to answer your questions. So the purpose really of this question, we we'll just talk about the first components, right? So let me start, really, you know, with, uh, you know, the emission in our own operation, which makes up, let's say, 25% of our, let's say, baseline footprint, right? And here, uh, our approach is actually this, you know, record, reduce, and replace, right? And record is to, first of all, you know, making sure that we have a strong, I would say, data workflow, right? To capture emissions internally, uh, you know, just in our own facility, for example, right? But also with our suppliers, if we're talking about, you know, the importance of supply chain on how, you know, we're using, I mean, ourselves, we have obviously partnering with CDP, you know, which will in turn, you know, map our suppliers, emission data and climate actions. So, so that's the first important piece, right? You know, knowing where we are, right? And the second is about reducing, and this is reducing, okay, you know, footprint, right? Which, you know, we have talked a lot about. And today, you know, with this, uh, uh, with the pandemic, I think reducing office is a great example of what we can do, right? But you reduce your logistic footprint, you review your network optimization, not necessarily just from a cost standpoint, but from, you know, I would say an emission standpoint, reducing, let's say, you know, the number of logistic routes, et cetera, right? So that's really your second part, right? And the third one is replacing, right? And you replace a product or a supplier, you know, with a lower uh, carbon footprint, right? You know, alternate energy sources, right? You're, you know, you will use, you know, you will source your own facilities from, uh, you know, from one type of supplier to, let's say, renewable type of uh, supplier, you will move to electrical fleet right, that you use to manage your operation. So, so that's really the, the first piece, right? The second one, which is obviously very important, is, is related to the technologies we offer, you know, our customers to support them in their mission to reduce CO2 footprint, right? And I think that uh, uh, along, I think, with this net zero commitment, we have also introduced in June our transition technology uh, portfolio that are actually today 100 plus technologies that we have identified as impact reducing. You know, and, uh, and our aim is to provide, you know, I would say a technology portfolio that help and support our customers there, you know, to reduce their environmental footprint across the entire cycle. Um, and of course, we have been trying to focus this portfolio on technologies and solutions um, that, um, um, that you know will, will provide the greatest, I would say, impact to our, to our customer, whether on CO2 emission or fugitive emissions, right? And this portfolio actually today, when I talk about 100 technologies, they have access, I mean, customers have access today to them, but also, you know, some that we are building and that actually are near, I would say, commercial, uh, that will be commercializing, I would say, in, in, the, in the coming months uh, or quarters, yeah? Uh, we, we spend a lot of time, obviously, to 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 you know to uh, qualify to, to to qualification process to quantify the impact of this reduction. So we provide, I would say, to our customer, you know, 
what are the exact impact of those technologies. Uh, and, uh, you know, we, we have been focusing on uh, different aspects. And I will give maybe a couple of examples, right? You know, uh, we have made significant progress developing technology to address gas and oil flaring, right? From well cleanup and, and, and testing, which account actually for, I think, I don't know, you know, between 3 and 5% of, of, of ENT CO2 emissions. You know, these technologies are operational and they are reducing, actually, they are being used today by some of our customers and they are reducing emission for them. You know, I think that Mete has mentioned that earlier, right? We have also technologies that focus a lot on operational efficiency. Yeah, we talked about digitization, right? I mean, you digitize some operation, you remove people, you know, going to the website, you manage all this, you know, I would say, uh, remotely and you reduce, obviously, clearly energy consumption, right? You will reduce... Uh, rig time because you know you, you work on technologies that will, will reduce rig time. Um, this will in turn reduce into energy consumption and emission reduction. So really, these are two key aspects. What we do in our own operation, but also you know all this technology we are developing to to decarbonize the industry. Great, there's some uh, great points there, Abdullah. Uh, so I'll turn to Frida. I mean, as a major NSC. Uh, uh, in Asia, you've heard what basically some of the suppliers, I mean, what uh, Abdullah has mentioned, what Matthew is saying. Uh, let me ask you, how is uh, Petronas, uh, how was Petronas planning before COVID uh, in regards to energy transition? And how has that strategy changed now, uh, post COVID now as well, in terms of what is your organization's goals and targets uh, now compared to what they were 18 months ago? Right, um, thank you, Pratesh, uh, for the question. Uh, Petronas embarked um, on its journey towards uh, a low carbon uh, economy even before COVID uh, began. Uh, we have started uh, reducing flaring and venting of hydrocarbons from our existing upstream and downstream operations. We also included designs for zero flaring and venting of hydrocarbons, as well as uh, CCS, uh, carbon capture and storage for some of our new facilities and projects. Uh, for example, our Kasawari CS CCS uh, is set to be the region's largest offshore CCS project, targeted to be on stream in 2025, uh, potentially reducing emissions uh, of up to 3.7 million tons of uh, CO2 per annum. And uh, since 2013, Petronas has reduced uh, GHG emissions by 13.4 million tons of uh, CO2 uh, equivalent until uh, the year 2020. Uh, we operationalized our gas and new energy unit in 2019, um, offering a one-stop cleaner energy solutions for gas, LNG, and uh, renewables. So gas and LNG are good base uh, load to complement renewable energy as emerging countries are shifting from coal to decarbonize themselves. Uh, we are the third largest energy producer globally and we have uh, uh, delivered more than 10,000 cargoes uh, to date. Uh, we acquired M Plus in India in 2019. That signified uh, our entry into renewables, actually, uh, with the cumulative capacity of about 600 megawatts uh, under operation and development. M Plus serves um, around 150 commercial and industrial customers at over 200 locations. Uh, across India and uh, the Middle East. Um, in fact, we're installing solar panels in our facilities and offices, and we're looking at uh, low wind speed turbine technology for our offshore platforms. Those were the activities that we did uh, prior to, to COVID. So given uh, COVID that has happened uh, and has been with us uh, for close to two years now, um, all demand before COVID was expected to peak uh, post uh, 2030. Um, however, this pandemic uh, somehow rather has accelerated the energy transition globally and it has brought the peak oil demand earlier, in fact. Um, I, I believe um, all of us read uh, the recent UN's uh, IPCC report, uh, which urged for immediate rapid and large-scale reductions uh, in GHG emissions. Um, and recently, um, back home, uh, there is a strong market push for renewable energy in Malaysia itself with uh, targeted 31% installed uh, renewable energy capacity by the year 2025 and 40% by the year 2035 uh, under its plan. Um, to us, this acceleration means that we need to intensify our efforts in reducing emissions from 
our operations uh, and deploying more low carbon energy solutions. Uh, definitely, we need to explore forms uh, beyond solar because solar at the end of the day is still our mainstay. Um, and recently, Petronas um, established uh, two new technology and research uh, centers in partnership with um, Imperial College uh, London and Harriet Watt University in the UK to push for greater technological advancements um, in low carbon and uh, cleaner energy solutions. Uh, we have also launched uh, the hydrogen business last year with blue and green hydrogen being um, our focus. Uh, we will definitely continue with our efforts uh, in emissions uh, reduction as well as um, electrification with renewables uh, to reduce offshore carbon emission. Currently, we have about one gigawatts uh, solar generation capacity in operation um, under both uh, development uh, and also the ones under development, both locally and internationally. Um, as for the technology front, um, our Petronas New Energy offers uh, solar, wind and battery energy storage solutions to our customers with focus in um, Asia Pacific itself. Uh, we have also ventured um, into providing um, electric vehicles for the last uh, mile delivery. Uh, we have about 200 electric vehicles deployed in four key cities um, in India, and we are fast ramping up to 600 by end of this year. Um, we also plan to become the end-to-end -end solution provider for hydrogen, combining strong partnerships and um, R&D into advanced uh, electrolysis to make this uh, commercially viable. Um, whether this has actually changed our organization goals and targets, uh, last year we, we set a target of uh, what we call moving forward together, 50, 30, 0, to steer Petronas in preserving value, pursuing growth, and intensifying our sustainability efforts. We want to achieve 50% uh, improvement in uh, cash flow from operations in five years, 30% uh, of revenue from non-traditional sources, uh, which include uh, renewable energy and um, our aspiration, which I think um, are also the aspiration of many of the oil and gas in achieving net zero carbon emissions hours by 2050, uh, with a near term target to cap uh, our GHG emissions at about 49 and a half million tons of CO2 equivalent uh, for our Malaysian operations. Uh, we have also set renewable energy generation target of about 3,000 megawatts by 2024. Uh, these are all part of our efforts to provide uh, cleaner energy solutions. Um, I, I guess in supporting um, emission targets and climate actions um, still remains challenging uh, for all of us. Um, it requires the oil and gas sector to be cost competitive by deploying the latest technology to reduce emissions, but we need to keep cost low, and we need to see innovation along the entire value chain. Um, at the same time, uh, striking a balance is also critical for us in maintaining our social license uh, to operate. As a national oil corporation, uh, Petronas has a responsibility to balance commercial targets with uh, social and environmental considerations and um, cli climate actions. So uh, that's uh, from Petronas. Perfect. Uh, that uh, gives some great views in terms of how, uh, you know, Petronas is dealing with uh, basically the energy transition as well as Equinor and Slumberjay's perspective as well. So let's just turn a little bit towards uh, the supplier side at the moment. So if I, if I turn back to you, Matty, I mean, across the organization, you know, there's been some large claims in terms of uh, how to reduce emissions. As a large operator, how do you choose to follow up with suppliers and deliver on these ambitious targets? Uh, what activities are you carrying out to achieve them? Well, thank you for that question. First of all, I must say, I think it's great to, to hear how aligned we are uh, across uh, the panel in terms of our focus areas. But uh, coming back to how we actually work with suppliers, uh, first of all, we select suppliers that share our ambitions on energy efficiency and emission reductions. Suppliers with the same strategic priorities, that is important to us. And we work closely with our suppliers to monitor effects, and this will continue to influence the expectations we set to our suppliers in the contracts. So that's why I like very, very much what I heard from uh, Abdullah. 
these high ambitions uh, will, of course, require investments uh, at a certain level, which cannot be repaid through short contractual commitments. So, as I said before, we want to go longer with fewer, meaning that we want more long-term cooperation with financially robust suppliers who are willing and able to join us in developing the solutions we need for tomorrow's operations. Um, to make this a bit more concrete, I, I, I would like to share some examples uh, with you on how we actually work uh, with suppliers to achieve our goals. First of all, electrification of our offshore installations in the North Sea is uh, one of the main measures to reach our climate ambitions for the next decades. And one specific example being the troll electrification projects where troll BNC will be electrified. Then um, uh, a second example is uh, our drilling rigs and how they are incentivized with a fixed fuel fee, which enables profit from reducing diesel consumption. And also together with our contractors uh, and uh, the government, uh, we have invested in several technologies and introduced energy efficiency measures. The effects of these efforts are monitored closely. So good to know that we have the focus from the, the suppliers as well, uh, like uh, we heard from, from Schlumberg share. Then we are running a renewal program on the commercial shipping fleet. One example is the introduction of very large gas carriers with dual fuel systems for the fleet transporting LPG to the world market, enabling those ships to run on gas, which is of course an important uh, uh, measure. Then moving on to, uh, to an example from uh, onshore, um, Onshore logistics is handled by a company uh, with ambitions of being a leader within green transport and supply bases onshore are fit with electric charging of uh, vehicles. Then I think I, I will also mention another example which is linked to um, an agreement to modify a supply vessel to get the world's first carbon-free ammonia fuel supply vessel covering long distances between our assets on the Norwegian continental shelf. And uh, I can't respond to your question without actually mentioning a, a very exciting project that we, we are part of, and that's the Northern Lights project, uh, where we work together with with partners to develop an offshore subsea CO2 storage facility, a so-called carbon capture, utilization and storage. Initially for selected Norwegian factories to deliver their CO2. Uh, and this is a groundbreaking government backed project. We are going to build the world's first special purpose low emission vessels designed for bulk transport of CO2 and use offshore wells for CO2 or storage. And then adding on to that, Equinor's low carbon strategy is also about growing in the renewables, as I mentioned before, and also becoming an offshore wind major. And we have passed important milestone and capture value from our position as a leader within offshore wind. Uh, I will give you a few examples on how we are working uh, together with the uh, partners. On our Empire Wind project in New York, we work together with BP to provide generation capaci capacity of 3.3 gigawatts of power to the state. Then secondly, another example, the Dogger Bank project in the UK, where we cooperate with SZ Renewables, uh, that will create 3.6 gigawatts. And then finally, a very exciting project uh, called High Wind Tampen. This is the world's first floating wind farm to power offshore oil and gas platforms on our Snorre and Gugfax fields. This is an exciting project to create synergies between renewables and our existing oil and gas operation. And then finally, I would like to also mention that we are also investing in solar projects in Brazil and Argentina, as well as innovative solar technology companies to show how 
solar power can provide scalable and profitable growth opportunities uh, for the future. So to sum up, as we accelerate within renewables, our ability to create and capture value will be even more important. So we see great opportunities to cooperate with new and also existing suppliers as we continue to grow in this area. I'm, I'm really looking forward to the continuation. And if, if I could uh, pick up on a word that you used early on, Mete, which is alignment. And I want to tie that back to what Adela said earlier about the record phase. So clearly, to know where we want to go and to know where we're starting from, we have to have very granular agreement on what those are. But the trouble is that the more you try to break things down, the harder it is to get consensus to build that back base. So, Abdel, if you could please kind of walk us through some of the difficulties in getting to those industry-wide standards. And then maybe if I could broaden the question a little bit and just ask you what your views are on uh, what some of the obstacles are uh, to reaching net zero emissions. Yeah, thanks for thanks for the question, David. Yeah. So, so maybe to, to start on a positive note, you know, I think in my mind, when you talk about obstacles, I think we have overcame the main obstacle as I think we all realize the criticality, you know, uh, and the need, you know, to decarbonize our industry. And I think that we have heard in this panel that most of us have committed, you know, to a lower carbon future. And I think in my mind, this is already uh, a big thing. And that's for me the main obstacle. And this, it, you know, has already, as I said, you know, been overcome, right? Now, now, this being said, obviously, there are several challenges, and a lot of them are around, I would say, uh, alignment and cooperation. And at all levels, not necessarily at the level of, of just an industry, right? And you're talking about, first of all, you know, at the level of governments, where you want to make sure that you have the focus of all governments, you know, on, let's say, the regulatory framework, right? Working with, you know, the different businesses and investors, right? Uh, we're talking about greater you know, cooperation amongst countries, right? To make sure that, okay, we have infrastructure. We talked a lot about some of the infrastructure that we depend on, right? In order to, 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 to get some of those progress, right? And the financing, and obviously the technology, right? That will, that, that will get us to reach the net zero in time. And I think that the last one, which is, uh, you know, which is very important, and I think Meta has made some very good point, is a greater cooperation amongst companies, right? To have, uh, you know, this common framework, um, and, and standards, right? So we can align on measurements, we can align on impact, uh, but also ensure transparency. Uh, and transparency in the way, you know, we work with each other, transparency of the way, you know, when we are going to, uh, to request, you know, for work. And, um, and, and today uh, we are, and, and maybe also this cooperation is also going to be a technology cooperation. And I think also Mete has mentioned some of those examples where you will need to cooperate. And this, I mean, I, I absolutely support, you know, the, and I, and I wrote it, this, uh, you know, long term with fewer, right? And I, I, and I absolutely adhere to that because it's going to be, I think, critical if we want to achieve our objectives, but also maybe to the, to the point uh, made also earlier is is also the cost challenge that we all have, right? So 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 that for me is important today. I think the reality is that we are still very far from you know reaching you know the, the objective. I think that we have too many standards. You know we have obviously also different maturity level across companies and you know and and countries. Um, I, when I look at Chambre, we have tried you know to follow a strong framework you know on. You know, the transition technologies I have mentioned earlier, you know, based on, you know, some of the industry standards, you know, guidelines, you know, data. We believe we have developed a robust quantification framework, you know, to standardize calculation and enable benchmarking, you know, through, you know, net footprint comparison. But the reality is that, you know, we need to ensure that this is consistent with what this is consistent with other, what other companies do, right? And in, in my mind, uh, yeah, getting a common standard within the industry and actually the whole solar industry will be a huge enabler, right, for our, uh, to reach our ambition. Uh, so I think that, yeah, we will not get there, but clearly this, this, is, this can be a huge enabler for us. Yeah. With Perfect. that, uh, I think I'll pass it back to you. No, that's great. Uh, 
So Frida, finally turning back to you in terms of, uh, so you, you've heard about some of the challenges uh, that we're facing with the supplies and then uh, how basically standards are basically, uh, you know, having a common set of standards across the industry. Um, how are you sort of helping suppliers and clients adopt to, to their needs and, and what sort of relation, how are these supplier relations adopting now under this new environment? Right, uh, thanks, uh, Pritesh. Um, Overall, the uh, transforming the suppliers to adapt to energy transition will require support and effort from the entire ecosystem. Um, it cannot just be from the oil and gas companies. Um, as for plans, uh, our plans to facilitate suppliers' energy transition, it is within our radar now. And uh, we're working closely with um, our newly appointed chief uh, sustainability officer on this. Uh, we also need to balance um, between affordability, security, and uh, sustainability. Uh, at least uh, as a start, what we've done is uh, we have generated uh, awareness in energy transition and it's brought plans on sustainability for our domestic uh, supply chain. Uh, through our industry publication uh, that we give out, uh, we have signaled the industry on energy transition and encouraged suppliers uh, to innovate and develop uh, sustainable solutions uh, to combat climate change. Um, we continue to collaborate with uh, industry players and stakeholders in the ecosystem to facilitate this energy transition. Key stakeholders uh, to us uh, is definitely our government, uh, even financial institution, the local suppliers and industry associations as well. Uh, we'll need to work together to address this transition. Uh, we are collaborating uh, with uh, Sustainable Energy Development Authority of Malaysia um, relevant financial institutions as well, and uh, selected EPC contractors uh, in a series of webinars serving as a platform uh, to share on business um, and industry outlook and diversification strategies, uh, for example, venturing into renewable energy. Um, at least uh, one of the things that we've done um, uh, earlier on uh, in 2019, we launched a vendor financing program. Uh, this is a collaboration uh, between Petronas and the local financial institution to facilitate local uh, suppliers financing, uh, and uh, which were very much affected uh, by COVID as well as uh, low oil prices. And uh, I think this is also the way uh, to go uh, for us as well in helping to facilitate those kind of arrangements uh, in the future. Uh, we have observed um, uh, several local companies paving their way forward uh, in energy transition, uh, for example, they've, uh, we've seen them embarking on new ventures uh, in solar and wind, uh, as well as EV battery technology. Uh, some international players working with us um, have also committed to emission reduction um, in their journey together with us. Um, uh, it's, it's very much still, uh, when it comes to on the supplier front, um, it's still at um, the, the early part of things, uh, but we, we hope to take it through um, much further as we move uh, forward. Thank you. Okay, perfect. I think uh, some really interesting points there in terms of examples of what uh, you know operators are doing, uh, both in Asia and in, in Europe and across the globe, and some specific examples of how strategies are changing. Uh, it's really interesting to hear from uh, basically the supplier side in terms of some of the challenges that are being faced, uh, in terms of reaching a common standard across the industry. Uh, and, it, and it's great to see how collaboration is, is, is sort of working across, uh, uh, you know, mo much more rapidly than previously in terms of the suppliers and on the operators in terms of how we're working together to achieve a net zero uh, target in the coming decades. So with that, I'd like to thank the panel for their time this morning, some really interesting points and uh, uh, examples that you shared with us. And uh, hopefully we'll see you all uh, in person uh, next year at Sarah Week. Thank you very much. <laughs>